Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Reimagining Soviet Georgia. In 1997, French historian Stéphane Courtois edited the Black Book of Communism, Crimes, Terror, Repression. The book had a singular goal, to frame the global experience of socialism in the 20th century as criminal. But more than a work of serious history, the book was intended to discredit French Marxism and more importantly for Courtois, the French Communist Party as an institution. Understandably, the book caused a huge controversy in France. Historians called into question its dubious sources, exaggerated statistics, and in particular, Courtois' controversial assertion that the systemic genocide of the European Jewry by the Nazi regime during World War II in Germany and by its allies was no different than the so-called class genocide undertaken by the Soviet state and other socialist governments. The claim was so outlandish and factually hollow that even two of the book's original contributors, Jean-Louis Margolin and Nicholas Wirth, distanced themselves from the publication and Courtois by writing publicly that they rejected such an incomprehensible comparison. In the year 2000, across the Atlantic, UCLA professor and Soviet historian J. Arch Getty also wrote a scathing critique of the Black Book of Communism. Getty argued the book's claim that Soviet socialism had a genocidal intent was wholly incorrect. The 1932-33 famine in Ukraine, for example, was not the result of an ideological or intentional desire to eradicate Ukrainians as a nation or a people, but rather the clear result of mismanagement and related industrial issues, and therefore cannot in any serious way be compared with the ideological, meticulous, and intentional mass killings undertaken by the Third Reich. Despite the scholastic shortcomings and inaccuracies of the Black Book of Communism, its goal was ultimately polemical, to call into question the formal historical memory of post-World War II Europe, that the Holocaust was a singular event, and that anti-fascism, left-wing partisans, and the Soviet Union played indispensable roles in Europe's liberation from Nazism and fascism. The implicit questioning of the Holocaust and critique of the European left catapulted this controversial book into a popularity, albeit a non-academic popularity, among some circles. It was translated quickly into German, Russian, Czech, Hungarian, Romanian, Polish, Estonian, and English. The book became a tool used by a group growing in significance at the European-wide institutional level in the early 2000s. Anti-communist memory entrepreneurs. In 2004, as the European Union began to enlarge and admit former socialist states in Eastern Europe, those representing these states in all European bodies, such as the Council of Europe, began to actively promote anti-communist memory politics. Their goal was to take the narrative outlined in the Black Book of Communism and formalize it into a common narrative for all of Europe. By criminalizing the socialist past, these memory entrepreneurs believed it would be possible to exclude socialism and Marxism more broadly from the plane of legitimate discourse in Europe, as years previous had done to Nazism and fascism. The book was referenced in events, exhibitions, speeches, resolutions, and elsewhere by the new anti-communist memory entrepreneurs in Europe as they struggled to make anti-communism a pillar of Europe's new post-Cold War political identity. The political struggle to formalize an anti-communist view of Europe's 20th century peaked in 2008 with the signing of the Prague Declaration on European Conscience and Communism by affiliated individuals and groups, asserting that a common European understanding of the past should view Nazism and Communism as historical equivalents. Despite pushback against these views, this process alone made anti-communism a constitutive aspect of what Europeanization meant for these newly mem admitted member states and other states in the post-communist world who wished to become members of the European Union. But anti-communism served another purpose as well. As Kristen Godsey points out 
in her 2014 article, The Tale of Two Totalitarianisms, The Crisis of Capitalism and the Historical Memory of Communism, just as the Black Book of Communism was initially an implicit critique of the French left, so too would anti-communist memory politics at the European-wide level function as a rhetorical cudgel against the leftward shift in European politics and the reinvigoration of Marxism globally after the 2008 financial crisis. So what did all of this mean for Georgia? As Georgia set its sights on Western institutional integration, the government of Mikhail Saakashvili pushed anti-communism, even importing the language of the 2008 Prague Declaration to inform domestic policy in Georgia with resolutions that banned communist symbols like the hammer and sickle, or even enshrining free market policies in the Constitution, and even going so far as to frame socialism as an alien other, external to the Georgian people. In 2009, the opening of a museum in Tbilisi called the Museum of Soviet Occupation was modeled off of similar museums in the Baltic states and elsewhere. In the Georgian version, concepts of Georgian sovereignty and a future of development were tied directly with the same anti-communism being pushed by memory entrepreneurs in European bodies. It became a fact of national definition. Georgia's Western aspirations were now defined by a direct rejection of the socialist past. On today's episode, to discuss all of this and more, we welcome French political scientist Laure Neumeyer, author of the 2019 book, The Criminalization of Communism in the European Political Space After the Cold War. Laura, thank you so much for coming on to Reimagining Soviet Georgia. Um, why don't you introduce yourself? Yes, well, thank you for um, inviting me to, to take part in these, um, those discussions. Um, so my name is Laura Neumeyer, and I am a professor of political science at the University of um, uh, Picardie, Jules Verne in France. Um, I have been uh, studying Central European politics uh, for about 20 years, and I have been interested uh, since the early 2000s uh, in um, debates about the past, about communist past. Uh, and I actually started working first on uh, reconciliation policies uh, implemented by the European Union and the Council of Europe uh, in, in Central Europe regarding painful pasts, um, first linked to minority issues and uh, forced uh, expulsions, etc. And that has uh, developed into an interest for um, the production of historical narratives at the European level. And um, in the, the way um, the communist experience, uh, especially, has given um, rise to uh, debates in European uh, arena, especially the European Parliament and um, the Parliamentary Assembly at the Council of Europe. Um, so how this uh, communist experience and the, the, the crimes committed by um, socialist regimes were being discussed after the Cold War, um, and uh, how these discussions uh, gradually shaped a historical narrative which is now prominent in uh, Western Europe and not only in national um, political spaces, but also how this discourse has been endorsed by the European Union and the Council of Europe. So, you know, the reason we wanted to invite you on to the show is because you wrote this book, The Criminalization of Communism in the European uh, Political Space After the Cold War. And I'm curious if you could just tell our listeners, you know, what is this book about? And how did you write it? And what is your basic idea? Mm -hmm. So my, my, the enigma that uh, sparked my interest was um, how could the EU, um, with the, uh, change its uh, historical narrative after 2004, 
to integrate um, uh, more than 10 countries that had had a completely different historical experience. Um, so what um, impact did the enlargement to the East have on the, um, the way the EU relates to its past and tries to promote a shared vision of the past? And um, I was uh, especially curious because um, when I was uh, studying reconciliation policies, um, there were very different visions of the past that couldn't really be reconciled actually in uh, European settings. And um, so I, I started to um, try to focus on the debates that had been uh, held um, in European assemblies and uh, especially to focus on the, the members of parliament who had um, put the issue of communism on the agenda uh, at the Council of Europe first, because that's the first organization that enlarged to the East in the early 1990s. And um, at the European Parliament after 2004, when um, most of the former uh, satellite countries joined the European Union. Uh, and my focus was really on anti-communist mobilizations. I wanted to approach the, the crafting of this new narrative through um, a, a study of um, individuals and how people, uh, some people said to mobilize and to um, actually call for the EU to, um, to adopt a narrative that has um, been considered as illegitimate uh, in Western Europe since the 1970s. And it's a narrative that states the equivalence between communism and Nazism. And um, in most um, European states that has been absolutely um, rejected as an official vision of history. And it was the, uh, the uniqueness of the Holocaust, of the singularity of the Holocaust that was really um, the core of the official vision of the past. And suddenly um, Eastern European uh, members of the of European assemblies um, set out to, uh, to question this singularity of the Holocaust and to say that to them, uh, Stalinism or even communism as a whole was also um, uh, a criminal ideology uh, that led to criminal regimes based on systematic terror uh, throughout the whole period until 1989, which is a very controversial uh, thesis, a very controversial vision of the past, and um, completely at odds with the prominent Western uh, narrative. So I was interested in this um, confrontation of visions of the past and in um, the way uh, newcomers in European assemblies could try to, um, to learn how to mobilize and how to, uh, to impose their own interpretation of history. Can you uh, talk about who are the main actors and what was their approach like? Like how was it, um, uh, let's say a theoretical approach or was it like, using guilt or like what were the certain things how did they try to mobilize what did they use and who were the main actors in, in which countries so the main actors that i studied uh, were um, uh, members of uh, european assemblies some of them joined the parliamentary assembly at the, of the council of europe some of them joined only the european parliament some of them were members of both assemblies at different points in time. And the, the time frame was between 1992 and 2014, because 1992 was the first debate about communism at the Council of Europe, and 2014 was the end of uh, the eighth uh, mandate of the European Parliament. So that was a clear ending for the, for the study. And um, I identified a group of uh, 18 members of parliament who were extremely active in uh, putting communism at the agenda, on the agenda of the assembly, drafting resolutions, organizing hearings, uh, calling on uh, member states to adopt legislation, et cetera. And um, so among these 18 uh, individuals, uh, 17 of them came from uh, the former Eastern Bloc, and uh, the exception was a Swedish uh, member of parliament. Um, and uh, so they mainly came from uh, the Baltic states, from Poland, 
uh, and um, most of them were um, conservative uh, members of the EPP, the European People's Group, uh, or the European People's Party, rather. Um, two of them were social democrats, one of them was a liberal, and that was uh, Bronisław Geremek, the former Polish uh, foreign affairs minister, uh, and two of them were from um, smaller, um, even more conservative political parties. So there was a very strong um, homogeneity in their geographical and political uh, affiliations, actually. It was a very homogeneous group. And um, the, uh, their argument uh, was based, um, it was a twofold argument. One uh, basis for their um, assertion of the equivalence of communism and Nazism one basis for that was um, uh, science, because a lot of them were historians or had been uh, had some kind of academic degree that um, made them qualified to talk about the past uh, based on some kind of expertise that they had. Um, and the second basis of their argumentation was uh, their own biographies, because uh, some of them had been uh, dissidents, had been jailed. Um, such as uh, uh, Bronisław Geremek, for example, who had um, spent some time in, in, in prison in Poland. Um, some of them had been um, oppressed by the communist regime. Um, one of them, one of these uh, memory entrepreneurs, uh, Sandra Kaniete, uh, was born in Siberia, where her parents had been deported. Uh, so she was born in relegation. Um, and um, a lot of them actually really uh, used this biographical element to um, testify to the criminal uh, nature of communism and also to bring some kind of emotional uh, element to their argumentation. Um, so, and, and depending on the settings, depending on the context of their, um, of their speeches, they would either speak as a historian or speak as a victim of communism. And they were very uh, talented in, in uh, alternating between these two uh, types of arguments. Now, maybe just to uh, clarify uh, for people listening, you know, why did they want to have uh, or to change uh, or to influence the narrative of historical memory in the European Union? You know, what was the reason or the motivation that a representative from Poland or from uh, Latvia or Lithuania might have to basically engage in a political struggle to um, change the historical narrative of Europe? Because as you said, as you said, the ones in Western Europe, and from what I read in your book, you know that in Western Europe, that this was seen as totally an illegitimate uh, political position to have up until the collapse of the Soviet Union, up until even after the 90s, up through the 90s, to have a legitimate uh, position that said that Stalinism or communism and Nazism were equivalent was seen as, you know, outrageous. Well, the, the question of their motivations was uh, really uh, one of, the, of my main questions as well. I wanted to try to understand uh, why they would um, embark on, on, on this um, uh, struggle. And uh, it was an extremely uh, contentious position to hold, especially as you enter an assembly as a, as a newly elected member. Um, and um, I think there were several motivations for their um, their mobilization, the, the biographical motivation, I think, was re really strong because they had been part of families that had suffered through communism or they themselves had had their uh, uh, professional life being um, made difficult by their political positions, etc. So there was really a personal element that was very uh, strong. Um, and I, I did a lot of interviews with them, so they each, almost each of them mentioned some kind of personal element in their uh, biography. Um, so one, uh, one motivation I think was really this very personal um, uh, experience of uh, political violence. Another motivation was ideological because most of them, as I said, were um, conservative. Uh, they came from the Christian democratic 
uh, group in European assemblies, and they um, strongly believed that communism as, as an ideology was a criminal ideology. Um, so they wanted this to be recognized and acknowledged uh, at the European level, and they um, often felt um, that the West couldn't understand this ideology because people had not been um, living under communist regimes. Um, and that was, I think, a third motivation for them. It was to um, try to teach the West about uh, what communism really was. And um, for me, it was quite interesting because um, I am French and a lot of these people whom I met told me, yes, but you can't really understand because uh, in France, you have a political party, which is communist, a communist party, which is legal, uh, has a legal existence, um, has been in government or, or even in the 1990s. Um, so they um, had the impression that my perspective was completely biased by the fact that I had not really experienced what communism really is and that maybe they thought that I had a, some kind of idealized vision of communism. And that's um, and that made it hard sometimes because I had to justify, you know, my own political motivations or lack of motivations because I'm a researcher and I was not uh, planning on defending communism in my book. Um, but I think this element that um, this perceived lack of recognition of uh, a historical experience was a very strong factor also in their mobilization. The idea is that um, when the EU enlarged, when the European Union enlarged, when the Council of Europe um, admitted new member states, um, there was really a lack of knowledge about uh, Eastern European history and a lack of, um, uh, of understanding for uh, what people had been through. And uh, so there was really this uh, will, I think, to, um, to promote um, some kind of historical reckoning also in Western Europe uh, and to achieve um, some kind of symbolic recognition of suffering. You know, I think an interesting uh, part of your book was about how these Eastern European um, post-communist memory entrepreneurs basically tried to frame the experience of communism as being the same as the way the West framed the experience of the Holocaust, right? So it seems to me that what they were trying to do was saying like, hey, this experience of the Holocaust that has become um, you know, un an unquestionable dogma or an unquestionable um, unifying piece of European historical memory oh, we have the same exact thing, and that is what makes us European, this idea that we are also victims, this idea. But what's, what's interesting about that is that by doing that, they actually um, kind of move away from being able to investigate the communist experience on its own merits, right? At least in the historical memory. There's no ability to engage with the nuance of what actually happened because they take this framework that was developed um, you know, in opposition to the, uh, a bit, you know, in opposition to the, to national socialism and national socialism, Nazism, and, and, uh, the experience of Nazism in Europe and the Holocaust, and then try to kind of like in, in, you know, use that to make sense of communist experience. And so, uh, I don't know what, what did, what do you think about that? What do you think about that way that the, the communist anti-communist memory entrepreneurs kind of imported this vision of their own historical memory from the West. Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's one of the great uh, paradoxes of, of their uh, position um, because they, I think they, they questioned um, the, the singularity of the Holocaust and at the same time, they used uh, the same um, uh, canons of representation of political violence that has been that have been uh, developed in the case of the Holocaust. So, in terms of uh, visual um, tools to raise awareness, in terms of, uh, for example, gathering uh, testimonies, uh, trying to to have um, a big um, database of, of oral history, 
uh, using, they used all the um, iconography of the Holocaust that is familiar to Western, um, to Westerners. Um, um, so if you, um, for example, have been to, um, the to Washington DC and to the Holocaust um, uh, Museum there, they have uh, also tried to really reuse those uh, museographic codes uh, and to apply them to, um, to communist experience and to so Soviet era uh, violence. Um, so, which is a bit um, difficult to do because um, by, by imitating the Holocaust uh, imagery, they also, um, uh, as you said, uh, are unable to really reflect on the, on the specificities of communism, but it's really because there is a strong uh, status recognition involved in their uh, mobilizations. Uh, what's interesting is then using the EU to get some legitimacy, then they actually strengthen their positions back home. So even like coming from Poland or whatever other countries, um, you know, there isn't a one understanding of communism. And so by having the back saying EU supports this vision, they have used it to erase every other person's memory of the Soviet Union or, or Eastern Bloc. Yeah, I think it's um, using a European arenas is, uh, is seen as a source of legitimacy, uh, of domestic legitimacy to increase the weight of their, uh, of their position. Um, so they used uh, European arenas because I think they wanted also to be recognized as uh, fully fledged members of uh, European uh, family or political space. Uh, so they needed to be recognized in European arenas, but being able also to say that uh, their position was backed by the European Parliament's resolution or by an official position of uh, a European assembly was also seen as um, adding uh, to their political credit at home and, and uh, justifying even more uh, the, the position they were taking. Um, and that's, that's also um, kind of complexity of these mobilizations because um, to gain uh, European credit and to, to be able to have their position endorsed in European organizations, they had to downplay the fact that um, at home they were facing oppositions and that their, their vision of communism was one vision among others. Uh, and they were trying to, um, to embody uh, the Polish vision or the Lithuanian vision about history, whereas uh, there are actually uh, very sharp conflicts uh, in those countries about what communism was and how, to, uh, how it should be assessed uh, retrospectively. So um, this um, um, claim to be, to, to be representing uh, just one true vision of communism was uh, really hard to, um, to, to, to make if, you, if one looks at the, the persisting conflicts that uh, uh, exist in, in Central Europe uh, about uh, the, the, the communist or the socialist uh, period. So who are, the, um, who are the people that fought back and said no? like in, in the EU, like who are the European countries or figures that were like, this is actually unacceptable. And second part would be like, how did um, like people who were occupied or were defending Jewish memory of the Holocaust, how did they react to this? Was there any like pushback or were they participating in this? Um, so at the European Parliament, um, the main uh, body that uh, pushed back uh, these anti-communist mobilizations was um, the socialists, the social democrat group uh, called the uh, SED group. Um, and um, anti-communist mobilizations in the European Parliament started um, as early as 2004, uh, when the, these countries joined the, the EU. Um, and there were debates about communism and about history that were held at the European Parliament. And in 2008, um, the Social Democrats um, set up a, a working group on history. 
and uh, they said that they had set it up to uh, to fight a rewriting of history, um, meaning that they um, accused uh, anti-communist uh, members to of, of being a, a revisionist and of, of writing history. Um, and this group was um, uh, negotiated very, um, uh, very, uh, uh, in a very, I mean, it was very difficult in uh, the, uh, made it difficult, sorry, for, for the anti-communist um, memory entrepreneurs to, uh, to have um, resolutions adopted and they fought uh, about the wording of, uh, of European resolutions very, in, a, in a very hard way. Um, and this working group was very interestingly um, made of uh, Western and Eastern members of parliament. Um, it was headed uh, by a Dutch historian who uh, often underlined the fact that he was a historian and the fact that as a Dutchman, he had no personal stake or no personal uh, experience. Uh, and that, um, that made him more neutral and he could rely on, on science, on expertise rather than emotions and, and um, personal life stories. Um, and the, the Social Democrats uh, working group was um, interesting in the way that among its Central European members, it had people who had had uh, very different uh, experiences during communism. Uh, one of them, um, Mr. Palekis, was uh, had been a high um, high ranking member of the Lithuanian uh, Communist uh, Party. Um, one member of the group who was a Czech uh, dissident, Libor uh, Hauček, uh, who had uh, had to leave the country. Um, one of the group was uh, Josef Pignor from uh, Poland, had been a member of Solidarity, uh, the Solidarity Movement. So they had really chosen um, uh, Central European members who could um, uh, exemplify the diversity of, uh, of uh, life that people had during communism uh, with um, people who had supported the regime, who had actively opposed it, who had had to flee the country, etc. And they, um, so they really were trying to show that there was not just one um, uh, vision of communism that could be um, imposed in Europe, but that you had to take into account the complexity of the period and how people reacted to uh, these uh, dictatorships and to the possibilities that uh, individuals had in, to, to, in relation to those regimes. Um, and, and this working group um, also included uh, a Spanish uh, member of parliament who had been a victim of Franco and who had been jailed and tortured during uh, the dictatorship of Franco to, again, to show that um, during uh, the 20th century, there were many dictatorships in Europe and not, not all of them were communist actually. And there were also military regimes that uh, use violence, et cetera. So they were really trying to, um, to, uh, to temper this idea that the only regimes that used violence uh, in Europe were communism, uh, the communist and, and the Nazi regime to add some complexity and, and uh, show a more, um, a richer vision of, of, of history, actually. Uh, so they fought back on, on mainly on ideological grounds uh, and also always underlining the complexity of history and the fact that um, European uh, history was not only about communism and, and Nazism, but that there were also other ideologies which had um, led to political violence. And um, for the other um, question you asked also about uh, whether representatives of the Jewish community try to, um, to defend another vision of history. Um, a lot of, uh, I mean, some associations um, and some uh, scholars also of uh, some historians um, took, took part in the debate about the equivalence of communism and Nazism and um, uh, several Jewish associations such as the um, 
the Simon uh, Wiesenthal Center uh, criticized very sharply uh, this um, assertion of the equivalence of communism and Nazism, uh, and uh, were quite um, uh, active also in trying to um, uh, to to propose a different uh, argument and and to uh, um, really question uh, this uh, equivalence. But they were not directly mobilized in European assemblies, um, and it was mainly the socialists and also the um, the, the far left uh, groups which were the the most direct uh, competitors of, of anti-communist. Um, uh, entrepreneurs in European assemblies. I actually love the what you call the memory entrepreneurs. Is this something you created? No, it's a category that has been um, uh, forged or well, coined by a, a sociologist, um, uh, Michael Pollack, who um, studied actually um, first he studied uh, how people um, were able to um, to survive and to uh, make sense of their experience um, after um, the being sent to uh, concentration camps during the Second World War. So he made a, a study of, of uh, Holocaust survivors and um, uh, to try to understand which types of individuals were able to uh, to produce a narrative about that uh, horrific experience after 1945. And he identified people that he called memory entrepreneurs because they were um, uh, people who uh, wanted to shape the narrative about the past and wanted to uh, establish some firm um, visions of the past and, uh, and norms to talk about the past and uh, impose those norms in, in the public space. So that was the origin of, of, uh, of the term, which has then been used uh, for different, in different contexts, in different historical contexts. But the idea is that um, uh, there are people who are really convinced that uh, what they, the interpretation of the past is the truth and that uh, they want to convince others that they are defending the truth and the only truth about the past. So which that makes them um, uh, quite uh, um, not very tolerant of other visions and of other interpretations. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, discussions in, in Georgia about memory and memory politics, remembering, and they have conferences and so on, but it's always the same people that equate um, fascism with communism. It is produced by them, it's made by them, so it's always very confusing why they're so uh, sort of obsessed with memory politics. In reality, they're creating a completely different memory themselves. But in a way, the way they uh, discuss it, it's like these other people are trying to remember communism well, and here's here's the real truth or something, you know? They're always trying to fight against nostalgia, as this word nostalgia they use for anybody that actually likes communism or had a good experience or has a horrible life now and would rather be, you know, under a Soviet Union. They always make it seem like they are something's wrong with them, you know, like, oh, either you're nostalgic or you're sort of you were unsuccessful in life and that's why you, you want this, but make it like, you know, a problem with themselves. You know, they make it an individual problem and not like facts or objective reality. Um, and so I uh, wanted to ask about, I don't know, like we had our, one of our first guests who discussed how Western donors sort of uh, give money often to a certain kind of memory of the Soviet Union, usually against it. Hmm. And maybe like if there's a connection between the EU of sort of fights and how the grants then became dependent on a certain memory that's that they want you to research. Mm -hmm. Well, that's also something that I have noticed in, in this research, the fact that um, uh, European foundations um, funded a lot of uh, events held by uh, anti-communist uh, memory entrepreneurs in the European Parliament. 
um, and the, it's mainly uh, the Robert Schumann Foundation and the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, uh, which are uh, pro-European um, Christian democratic uh, foundations. Um, and they were very often associated with um, uh, hearings and conferences uh, at the European Parliament that were meant to uh, to uh, shed light on um, political violence during communism and also uh, to call for um, legal um, treatment of uh, what memory entrepreneurs called communist crimes, uh, because these um, members of parliament wanted uh, actually the European Union to set up an international court to, uh, to, uh, to bring to trial former communist leaders. So they, they had quite an active campaign. Um, on that topic, uh, and uh, these conferences involved uh, legal scholars, politicians, uh, members of the European Parliament, and they were very often held uh, with the, the support, moral support, maybe financial support, that I don't know, but of the, of the Robert, Robert Schumann Foundation and the, the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. So yeah, they were present and funding just one, one side of the story. And uh, I haven't seen them uh, uh, involved with uh, other um, groups that would hold a different vision of history. I remember that in the book, you had mentioned at one point that there was a declaration, a European wide declaration that made some kind of suggestion about how uh, historical memory, uh, these kind, this kind of vision of historical memory could be remembered locally. And one of them had to do with museums. Right. And um, I re and I know that, uh, you know, very, we've, we've mentioned this on the show before, but, you know, in Tbilisi, there's this very well-known museum of Soviet occupation, which was supposed to replicate, um, I believe, the Baltic, one of the uh, museums in the Baltic states. And if I also remember coming from your book, you'd mentioned that the discussion of the utilization of museums um, was something that had been discussed um, as a tool for, um, you know, remembering uh, this, um, this quote unquote totalitarian past. And so, you know, what's interesting here in Georgia is the fact that such a museum is, is kind of presented as being this natural position of the Georgian people's, you know, disgust with communism. But in actuality, there's a very, very specific political and historical context in which such a museum would even be thinkable. Uh, and I'm, I'm curious, like, you know, it's I guess it's interesting to me that you have this very particular narrative uh, that then becomes uh, taken up or particular tool that gets taken up to present a particular narrative um, in, a, in different countries. And so uh, I'm curious if you could just speak a little bit about how this, this topic of museums <laughs> and how they were, the, the anti-communist museums were used. Yes, um, so the, the, the European Parliament adopted a resolution in 2009 uh, on, I quote, European conscience and totalitarianism. And um, it was adopted with a, an overwhelming majority of votes. And it called for uh, member states uh, to implement um, awareness raising and educational activities. And um, among those activities were uh, uh, museums that uh, were supposed to, um, to educate, to educate uh, people about what communism was, and, but educate them in, in also in uh, uh, defending human rights. And it's this, um, again, this, um, this type of museums that uh, had been already um, uh, created in, uh, in the West about the Holocaust and with the, the main template being the, the Washington DC Museum, um, the Holocaust Museum. And um, the European Parliament's resolution um, so mentioned the importance of museums to, to really uh, reach out to a general public, 
uh, to um, and it's also linked to the this perceived lack of uh, lack of knowledge about West uh, about Eastern European history in the West. So to try to correct this um, this uh, ignorance of Western European publics for uh, what happened in in um, Central Europe during the Cold War. Um, so there was, but but even if the European Parliament supports the creation of history, it doesn't have any uh, competence to really. Uh, force member states to act. Um, so actually um, this uh, template of, of museums uh, was really um, created, uh, I mean, museums of, of communism or communist occupation, it's really a Baltic uh, idea. It was in Lithuania and then in Latvia that uh, such museums were created. And they were then, um, imitated uh, in, uh, in Hungary uh, with the House of Terror, in uh, Poland with the, um, the uh, Museum of the um, Warsaw Uprising. Uh, and it's in these museums that a, a so-called anti-totalitarian vision of history is being uh, disseminated. And um, in, in Latvia and Lithuania, I guess that's where the Maybe the parallel with Georgia is the closest because it's really museums about uh, occupation, about um, uh, that depict the whole Latvian nation or the whole Lithuanian nation as having been oppressed by a foreign um, uh, power. Uh, it's like this David and Goliath uh, struggle, uh, and um, it was um, in Lithuania especially. Uh, when the museum was uh, was set up, uh, it was called the the Museum of Genocide, and uh, but it didn't mention the Holocaust at all. The genocide was supposed to be the genocide of the Lithuanian nation, and it's very recently that the Lithuanian Museum has changed its name uh, to uh, to a more neutral and less um, less um, uh, how to say controversial name. Uh, so the, the European Parliament really um, supported these um, calls for the creation of museums, but um, one of the, the aim also of the memory entrepreneurs is to have a museum in Brussels near the European organizations, which would be really um, created by the EU, financed by the EU, and which would endorse that anti-totalitarian discourse. Um, but that hasn't happened yet. Uh, I mean, there is a, an NGO uh, called the Platform of European Memory and Conscience, which uh, is uh, has been uh, trying to um, has been yeah trying to 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 have this project uh, carried out, um, but um, they haven't really they they have the political support of the European Parliament, but it hasn't been enough to really uh, make this uh, museum possible. So it's still uh, planned, but um, they have found a, a spot in Brussels. They have um, an architect who's willing to um, to build the museum, but the problem is the problem of funding. So uh, so far, this uh, project hasn't really materialized. Was there funding uh, like allocated for the museum 2009 resolution? No, 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 no. It was just a, a general call for. Um, uh, for member states actually to to set up their museums um, and in the in the status that created the platform of European memory and conscience in 2011 um, the one of the goals of the platform is to to have this uh, European uh, museum in Brussels but uh, um, it hasn't secured any fundings from the European Parliament which is also a reason why, um, uh, anti-communist memory entrepreneurs uh, think that there is a, a double standard in the EU because the European Parliament has funded uh, a museum called the Museum, uh, the House of European History, which opened um, maybe 10 years ago in Brussels and uh, has been completely funded by the EU. Uh, and they would like the same uh, to happen again for their own museum uh, but the the European Parliament hasn't uh, hasn't uh, agreed to that because 
the House of European History covers the history of, um, of the whole European continent, including Central Europe and the Balkans. And um, so the European Parliament said, well, we have uh, already a museum which uh, includes the communist experience, so we, there is no need to, uh, for, for the EU actually to pay for another one. Um, and the House of European History uh, has been uh, fiercely criticized by uh, these memory entrepreneurs because they think that communism is portrayed in a positive way uh, in this museum and that uh, it doesn't um, uh, it, it, it kind of downplays the, the, the violence involved in those regimes, it portrays them as kind of... Um, uh, soft uh, authoritarian dictatorships where actually some people had a nice life, etc. So they are very critical of the House of European History and they want their own more radical uh, vision of the past to be uh, uh, promoted in another museum, but they haven't managed yet to, uh, to, to, build, it, to build it and to, to finance it especially. So what I'm really hearing is they want a lot of exceptional treatment, it feels like, right? Because if you have... I mean, they seem to want to have a lot more, I guess they assume that their traumas, I don't even agree with their, their traumas, but they're, they're assuming that they somehow need more exceptional, more, more care, more money than everyone else. Like their problem is like much higher than everyone else's, especially when Europe has, you know, hundreds of years of, of real genocide of, of you know of slavery and like imperialism that doesn't seem to need to get a, a museum of their own but like uh, communism needs an entire museum where they are told that they're like you know mass murderers. Um, actually, going back to that, um, how, how many or are there EU resolutions regarding imperialism or anything else that has happened on European soil? Has there been any resolution denouncing any of the uh, mass killings of Africans or, you know, you know, of um, of indigenous people? Has there ever been anything to do with the imperialism of Europe? No, no, no. Well, first, just to go back to what you were saying about the fact that they want more than other people, and then I will I will uh, answer the other part of your question. I think what they want is they want the EU to recognize them as double victims. As double as victims of two dictatorships that were equally evil and have to be exactly equally condemned, and that involves uh, history, that involves also uh, judicial uh, proceedings against former leaders. Um, a lot of them say, you know, they are a ninety-year-old uh, former Nazi. Uh, uh, camp uh, guards who are being tried in in, uh, in Germany right now. Uh, the same should apply in Central Europe. People, uh, former communist leaders, or not even leaders, but um, executioners, uh, people who who made the system possible, uh, should be uh, prosecuted. And I think what they they really want is this equal status with the Holocaust and this recognition of their double victimhood. Um, and uh, if that cannot be achieved in, uh, for example, the House of European History, because it has a more balanced view of, uh, of the history of the continent, then they want their own space where they can, they can promote this vision of history. Um, and uh, the, the second um, issue uh, that you raised, and I'm sorry, I, yeah. I've uh, forgotten the second part of the question now. Um, I'm saying with Europe's very bloody history, has there been any resolutions yeah. about that? I mean, it's uh, interesting in the other kind of exceptional phase that I think that Eastern Europe gets a lot more exceptions than everybody else. Yeah, uh, so that's also a very interesting point in, in these uh, anti-communist mobilizations because they, these um, members of parliament um, really pushed for uh, the EU's remembrance policy to include uh, the crime of uh, communism, what they call communist crimes, meaning all types of political violence from 1917 to 1991. So, and they successfully uh, reshaped the remembrance policy of the EU to include the whole socialist period. 
uh, as being a period of dicta dictatorship. But um, when this remembrance policy was being um, uh, designed, there were discussions as to the scope of the remembrance policy, whether it should include uh, right-wing dictatorships, whether it should include uh, the regimes of uh, Franco, uh, Salazar, uh, Mussolini, Pétain, uh, the Greek um, uh, junta from um, the 70s, or uh, whether it should just be about communism and, and Nazism. And of course, the anti-communist uh, entrepreneurs just wanted uh, communism and Nazism to be uh, mentioned and to be the only regimes that would be uh, remembered and condemned. And um, left-wing members of parliament from the Social Democratic Group and also from the GUE, the, uh, the un unitary uh, European left group, they were um, in favor of uh, broadening the scope of this remembrance policy to include slavery, to include uh, colonialism, um, and uh, to really uh, go further in time and to um, acknowledge also mass violence that had been perpetrated by Europeans uh, on other continents and against, um, against uh, other non-European peoples. And, uh, but that was absolutely not uh, admitted. And um, apart from these uh, left-wing groups, nobody wanted to touch upon uh, slavery and colonialism in, in these official parliamentary resolution, resolutions. So the compromise was that um, first, the remembrance policy was only about Stalinism and Nazism. And then it was enlarged to um, other defining moments in European history, but it doesn't go uh, further than uh, what happened on the European continent. And um, if you look at the projects which are actually uh, supported financially by the European Union, most of them uh, deal with Nazism and with uh, communism. And the other, even like um, fascism or uh, the, uh, the military regimes are um, not, uh, don't receive as much funding in terms of, uh, of remembrance policy than communism and Nazism. I have a two part uh, question or maybe two questions. The first one is that in your book, you also talked about how there was a tension within the anti-communists about whether or not to um, you know, frame Stalinism or Marxism slash communism in general as being uh, a criminal or enterprise. And I'm wondering if you could talk about that and then the second part of this is that there was also a tension about whether or not, you know, uh, the equivocation of Nazism and uh, communism would result in criminal, uh, could be criminalized, because that's a major theme in your book about whether or not there was going to be this uh, judicial backing to the memory entrepreneurs uh, goals. And so, you know, what was the, I guess, the limitations and the successes and the failures of their strategy to criminalize this communist past? And then the second thing is, is this tension between Stalinism as a temporally defined phenomenon within the socialist experience versus Marxism um, and communism in general as being a criminal, quote unquote, or, um, you know, uh, historical aberration that needs to be corrected? Um, well, regarding the distinction between Stalinism and, and uh, communism as an ideology, actually, um, most of the, the anti-communist um, memory entrepreneurs uh, wanted the whole socialist period to be condemned. Uh, because they said that um, violence existed un up until 1989 in, in Central Europe, even if its, uh, its intensity changed, its form varied. Uh, but for them, uh, the, the possibility of violence existed un until the end. And so there shouldn't be any difference between uh, the Stalinist period with like mass uh, purges, uh, executions, deportations, etc., and uh, the, the more uh, targeted violence of the 1970s or 1980s. Uh, and that was one of the points of um, conflict with the, the left 
uh, which uh, said that uh, uh, you couldn't really um, uh, consider that um, the 1950s, the violence of the 1950s was equal to the violence of the of late socialism. So then, then there was a, a discussion about that. Uh, and the official position of the EU is uh, that the whole communist experience has to be condemned and that these regimes were uh, violent and, 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 and up to, until the end. Um, for the second part of your question about the criminalization, um, so that is clearly uh, a failure of the memory uh, entrepreneurs. They succeeded in really um, imposing their uh, anti-totalitarian narrative, what they called anti-totalitarian narrative, but they failed in um, their attempt to uh, really have uh, legal tools used at the European level to uh, put formal leaders to trial, uh, to um, ban uh, the use of uh, communist symbols, uh, the hammer and sickle, for example, where uh, they wanted them to be banned in the public uh, space. Again, using the analogy with the Holocaust and the fact that um, in some member states, uh, Nazi symbols are uh, forbidden and, and are banned from, from being publicly displayed. Um, one, one uh, and that was really a, an important part of their um, struggle of their mobilizations to um, have the EU use legal tools and they have been completely um, unable to, to achieve that um, because the, there was there were discussions um, with the European Commission, discussions in the EU Council of Ministers also, about um, uh, penalization, the penalization of historical denial. Uh, and that was a discussion which had been uh, very complex and very long in the EU um, and had been first initiated to ban uh, historical uh, denial of the Holocaust. And um, anti-communist uh, memory entrepreneurs wanted to also ban, uh, to, to again, uh, really do for communism what has been done for Nazism uh, in terms of also of legal tools. Um, but um, they, they wanted to, um, uh, to, to make it illegal to deny what they called communist crimes. And um, the EU replied that actually all its legislation was based on um, uh, the definition of, uh, of international crimes that dates back to 1945. And, the, and that definition um, does not recognize uh, social status or political um, convictions as part of the reasons uh, for um, political crime that can be um, condemned and the, the, the denial of which can be uh, penalized. So there was a, a, a struggle actually to enlarge the definition of uh, international crimes to include crimes committed on uh, grounds of uh, social status or, or political convictions. But that, uh, that uh, battle, uh, which was led mainly by, by Lithuanian, Latvian and Polish uh, members of parliament, that battle was lost, actually. They didn't uh, reach an agreement with uh, in, in the, the Council of Ministers, and that blocked uh, the whole, um, the whole uh, path of, uh, of proper legal criminalization of communism. So what they are trying to do now uh, through the platform of European memory and conscience is to, they're trying to... Um, to um, uh, so have uh, national courts actually uh, take up uh, trials of former communist leaders, but uh, I don't think that there would be any move at the European level to create a court or to uh, to ban the, the denial of communist crimes. That's a battle that has been lost, and and in exchange they they got uh, more money for uh, the remembrance policy, but um, the the judicial path seems really to be blocked at the EU level. 
So I feel like because it's blocked a lot of the more, more legal recourse, I feel like that's like a soft no to their politics without actually confronting a lot of the politics, what I'm getting a sense of. So like, I feel like this, um, why do the acknowledgement, right? Why acknowledge and condemn communism? Why give all this money or not money, but at least resolutions of saying, yes, you should create museums, but then do nothing to actually go after so-called the you know the war criminals uh, of the Soviet so Soviet you know versions of the Nazi what they're trying to do right equate both in the same way so what what are what do you think that means like what is the essence of that because that makes no sense to me then I wouldn't really like it's that's something like a soft like I'm pretending to agree with you when I'm not really giving you any real you know agreement or help tools well um it's true that it's not logical okay um and i think that it's really a political compromise between the left and the right and between the east and the west in the eu um the official explanation given by the european commission is that um, there is nothing in uh, eu law that uh, mentions um, uh, political crimes based on social status and or political conviction. And so the EU can condemn uh, genocide, can condemn, uh, can condemn crimes against humanity, but based on that specific definition given in 1945 uh, for um, uh, violence committed on, uh, based on ethnic, uh, religious, um, racial criteria. So, the EU found a very good uh, legal argument, which can be used to hide uh, another political motivation, which is, uh, in my view, um, the, the fact that Western Europe uh, uh, still believes in the, the, the singularity of the Holocaust. And that's why uh, there is no consensus to enlarge this definition of genocide, which would open up a judicial path for a real condemnation of, of communism, a legal condemnation with, with um, the possibility to prosecute people, to, to ban uh, symbols, etc. cetera. Um, so this focus on remembrance, on victims, etc., cetera, is um, really a way to, um, to avoid uh, the conflict over uh, the equivalence of communism and Nazism, because everybody agrees that victims should be commemorated, they should not be forgotten, uh, and it's the only consensus that could be reached in the European Union to, um, to allow for, the, for these two visions of the past to coexist. One vision which is still very strong, uh, uh, the, the, the singularity of the Holocaust, and one vision which is uh, the opposite and the equivalence of communism and Nazism. And um, the remembrance is, is very, policy in the EU is, as in other cases, um, it's a second best, actually. It's what you get when you can, cannot get uh, judicial uh, judicial measures when you cannot get true justice in terms of like really uh, legal tools. Um, and that's what happened to the, the anti-communist member entrepreneurs. They got something in, which is very important for them morally, symbolically, politically. They got this recognition that communism was a totalitarian ideology, uh, etc. So on the face of it, their discourse uh, has been endorsed by European institutions. But when it comes to translating this discourse into uh, judicial steps, they failed. And I think they failed because um, even if they maybe don't want to say it, um, Western uh, European states still hold the vision that the Holocaust was a unique um, uh, event in history. Uh, and that it deserves some special uh, treatment and that um, in legal terms, the definition of international crimes of 1945 should not be amended. Um, are there any groups like in Portugal and Spain, uh, you know, in, and the Mussolini is not condemned alongside Nazism, right? Fascism is not the same, like Italian fascism is not equated to Nazism? 
You mean in, in the Thank EU you. discourse? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, is did did Mussolini sort of not be counted amongst the same level? No. No. There have been attempts, for example, to uh, to have the European Parliament adopt a resolution uh, to condemn the um, the uh, the coup uh, that Franco. Um, uh, did in 1936, and there was uh, uh, in 2006 there was a mobilization to have a condemnation, which would have been the same uh, condemnation as the the one of the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact, for example, um, and uh, that completely failed, and it failed because the president of the European Parliament said that um, it was impossible to have the Parliament. Um, Acknowledge each event in the nation in, in the national history of uh, the 25 or 27 member states, and that uh, it was um, some kind of in, in, uh, demand that couldn't be met, uh, and that only European wide uh, historical events could be uh, commemorated in, uh, in the European Parliament, which is completely true because at the same time, for example, there was a resolution adopted by the parliament on the Srebrenica massacre and its meaning for Europe and uh, etc. Which um, I'm, I'm not at all criticizing the fact that a resolution was adopted, um, but it's the Srebrenica massacre had European wide dimension, but so did the fact that Franco seized power. Uh, so again, it's not a very logical uh, standpoint from, from the European parliament, but that's that's what happened. So there, were, and and the the Spanish um, uh, People's Party, actually the uh, the right wing uh, heir to the Franco regime, has also mobilized very strongly at the European Parliament to completely forbid any uh, discussion of, of the Franco regime uh, in European assemblies. There are other other people like organized groups who are fighting for you know any kind of memory. Uh, remembrance of of right wing fascist or pseudo fascist governments at all. Like the, like Eastern Europe is still very well organized. They're now they're doing the Ukrainian famine, trying to make that into an ethnic group thing about Ukrainians being, you know, killed on purpose. Right. So they're constantly they're I mean, they never get tired. Right. It's like they lose one resolution or they get well. You know, they do it again and again. And it's like their entire politics is these this is how they like that's what their politics is is to continuously do this and play victim and try to get everybody else to sign on board and they never stop so like i'm trying to figure out why um the right wing you know in post-communist countries never stop yet there seems to be a much quieter lull amongst sort of the you can say left wing or victims of all these right wing um uh, governments former right wing governments in Western Europe. Yeah, in Western Europe. I think um, I think you're completely right. And I would interpret this. I, I think the reason is that uh, the right is strong in the European Parliament. Uh, there is a conservative majority in the European Parliament. It has been the case for decades. And they just are able to block any attempt to discuss uh, right-wing dictatorships or military dictatorships. Uh, to me, it's as simple as that because the Social Democrats, uh, the the GUE, the the, the, the far left uh, political group, uh, un unitary uh, left group in the European Parliament, have have tried uh, to to have those uh, dictatorships also discussed and put on the agenda, and they they fail because they are just uh, too small to really uh, uh, in main manage to, to, to impose that uh, discussion, whereas the anti-communist uh, uh, groups from Central Europe were uh, strongly backed by Western uh, right-wing uh, forces, which are dominant in the parliament. You know, uh, this is one dynamic um, that I meant to bring up earlier um, that your book touches on, at least implicitly, is the way that the memory entrepreneurs will sort of like learn this language of a um, liberal democracy, sort of European progressive values in these European wide institutions, 
But then when you actually look at the historical memory, national historical memory that they're trying to rehabilitate, you know, in the case of, say, Lithuania, you have basically and it's not in the European Union, but in the case of Ukraine post Maidan or in the case of a number of other countries, you have this attempt to rehabilitate basically Nazi collaborationist nationalists or Nazi collaborationist nationalism. But then there's like the European Union will be a way to help them nationally rehabilitate those figures by saying that no, 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 you know, the uh, Ukrainian insurgent army is actually a liberal, uh, you know, force Mm -hmm. or that these Nazi collaborationists in Lithuania are actually a liberal national force. And so to me, the the most disturbing thing is basically how a segment of the European right based in the post-communist world is actually able to make this or clarify this connection between this liberal, uh, supposedly democratic values of the European Union and actually use it to sort of prop up, justify, and strengthen um, the thing that the European Union's memory politics say that they're against, which is the you know, specificity, specificity and uniqueness of the Holocaust. You know, actually their, their own values are being reused to strengthen the, the, the you know, Nazi collaborationists Absolutely. in the yeah. East. So this to me is, and it's even in Georgia, it's, it's less pronounced, but it's still there that there are these figures, you know, who are may, maybe fought with the first republic, the independent Georgia, and then went and fought with the Nazis and now are sort of lauded or paraded as being, you know, real Georgian heroes that represent your George's European path. Um, and this to me is actually the point that is, I feel like the most critical one that I learned from your book, even that touches on, I'm wondering if you could maybe just talk about that. Yeah, no, it's true that um, in the name of European values, uh, some historical figures or some regimes are being uh, positively presented, uh, although they were absolutely uh, not regimes that uh, in, in defended those values or uh, and the case of Ukraine, I think is a, is a very good one, but also I think this, um, the it applies also to uh, all the autocratic regimes of the of the interwar period in central europe which are being presented as this kind of golden age of uh, prosperity and democracy before uh, the catastrophe happened and communism was uh, imposed by foreign uh, powers which uh, is a complete rewriting of history and not only the history of the communist uh, period, but also what came before and the the regimes and the the anti-democratic regimes that were already in place before uh, 1994, 95. Actually, so I would like to maybe think about the future. So if this is going to be a continuing process, do you think, um, and what is, you know, what is the future of these sort of memory um, resolutions that like uphold certain memory politics of the EU? And where do you see ruptures maybe in this, um, in the next coming years, I guess? Well, I think that these mobilizations were really uh, very lively and very strong. Um, especially in the European Union between 2004 and uh, 2009, which was the first mandate when uh, you had um, people coming from Central Europe and these new, newly uh, elected um, members of parliament who really wanted to to change the narrative about the past. And um, I have the impression that this narrative, so has been really um, endorsed by the uh, by the European Union, and which means that it's become a routine way of referring to the past. And these mobilizations actually have lost their intensity. Um, they uh, these res- several resolutions were adopted, um, and but after two thousand and nine, I think that really the height of attention paid to communism. Uh, was reached and um, they have been attempts to um, adopt other resolutions which have failed, uh, especially in 2013, there was a resolution about education, 
uh, that was completely rejected by the, the Committee of Culture of the European Parliament, even before it could be discussed in a plenary uh, session. Um, and um, in 2019, the European Parliament adopted a resolution again about uh, the molotov ribbentrop Pact and, and uh, the history of Central Europe, and it was adopted almost without any discussion and without uh, being uh, noticed. So I think that the symbolic value of these resolutions is actually decreasing. You know, they are adopted, uh, but they don't stir up more much debate. Uh, and anti-communist memory entrepreneurs are still active in the, in the European Parliament, but they speak to each other uh, mainly. Uh, it's a small group of, of conservative uh, MEPs from the Baltic States and Central Europe, and they really uh, have trouble engaging with other segments of the assembly, and they have trouble engaging with uh, so Western European societies and having uh, any resonance in, in, uh, outside of their national uh, political arenas. So um, I have the impression that those, these mobilizations uh, will probably continue because they have a domestic value for these people. They, they bring some political credit to them. Um, but uh, their significance at the European level, I believe, is actually decreasing. They've become part of the routine of discussions about the past, um, which uh, is already something because this idea that both dictatorships were equally criminal has been accepted. Um, but the, 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 the discourse is um, I think at the moment it's only a discourse and it doesn't result in fundings for museum, it doesn't result in judicial steps to create a, a, a court in the EU or to, uh, to ban uh, the, the symbols of, uh, of the communist ideology, etc. So it's, it has been institutionalized, routinized, and in a way it's lost its, uh, its uh, disruptive um, dimension. Um, is that worse that it's normalized, right? Now it's normalized to discuss, to say totalitarianism, to say, you know, whatever, genocide or, or whatever, maybe not genocide, but in a lot of ways, I think that the way it's discussed often in Georgia, even by a lot of the academics are trained in Central Europe or they are here with the same memory politics, getting funding from the same type of people that, that you know, um, reproduce these um, understandings and so like I feel like for them it's you know fait accompli you know like it's finished for them because it, they have gotten mostly what they have gotten I don't think they'll stop because I think it's a very very powerful symbolic way that they seem to um, organize themselves around is that um, I would actually would love to see what would happen if I don't know uh, the African immigrants have come over and have resettled in, in France or, or, you know, different countries ever try to put through any kind of um, um, resolution dealing with colonialism. I would love to see how that goes, what the debates would be around that, you know. No, it's true that it's they they have succeeded in, in, in normalizing their, their discourse. Um, but I think they want more. They wanted more. I think they really wanted uh, the EU to uh, to to put somebody on trial. They their model was the Nuremberg trial, but also the uh, the um, uh, ex Yugoslavia uh, international court uh, for for ex Yugoslavia, and that's something that they haven't achieved and probably won't achieve, uh, which is seen by them as a as a something missing. So some kind of, of a failure. But I think that on the symbolic and, and moral uh, di dimension, the dimension they, they have one, they, this discourse is now uh, considered as a, a true interpretation of history. I'm also curious if you could mention, you know, the role of maybe larger or external factors in uh, pushing or promoting mm -hmm 
the memory entrepreneurs and these debates. And uh, I'm thinking about two in particular. The first one is, you know, the role of the kind of resurgence of the left after the 2008 financial crisis. You know, to what degree was the, you know, resurgence of an anti-communist politics at the European wide level being, you know, um, kind of stoked by the fact that there was a resurgent interest in anti-capitalist politics in the European continent um, after the 2008 financial crisis and directly before. And then the second thing that I'm interested in is the way that geopolitics with Russia affect mm. the way that a communist memory entrepreneurs are navigating or you know mobilizing these ideas because to me it seems like these are two factors that aren't necessarily related but are two external maybe factors we could say are external to the particularities of the um uh member states but have something have other forces at play to why mm -hmm. these become debates but i think both factors actually function as um as a threat that the uh, anti-communist uh uh, right will uh, use to justify its its uh, discourse on the past uh, because they often point to uh, the threat that Russia is uh, still posing to uh, the Baltic states or uh, to uh, to its neighbors. Uh, they also mention the fact that um, um, they say that uh, the West hasn't uh, learned the lessons of. Uh, communism and uh, the way it has learned the lessons of Nazism. So um, the, the fact that uh, there were uh, uh, left-wing movements uh, after the, the, the financial crisis, which were more uh, prominent and, and, and were uh, actually reinforced by the, this crisis, is, is also interpreted as um, a threat against uh, European values and uh, a further justification for the fact that this condemnation, uh, this uh, very strong moral condemnation of, of communism is needed if we want to protect uh, European values. So these two factors uh, are really used as a, an argument uh, that would um, supposed to justify actually their, their discourse about, uh, about communism. And um, they, they often repeat that uh, there has been no Nuremberg of communism and that it's badly needed you know, to make a break uh, with the past, uh, fresh, uh, to start uh, uh, from, uh, from, from a, a, a cleaner, uh, with a cleaner plate and to uh, really um, be able to draw lessons from communism. They believe that we haven't. We've drawn lessons from Nazism, but not from communism. And that is a uh, uh, yeah, kind of insidious uh, threat against uh, liberal democracy. Interesting because the um, George, I, don't, I think we might have mentioned this last time we spoke, but the opposition parties, including the ruling party, but they deploy it less uh, because they're in position of power right now. Um, they constantly use anti-communism as a way to win things or you know get their way, but also to com constantly complain when they're not winning. Right? <laughs> they made like this Libertarian Party made an entire video that everything that is bad today is communism's fault, Lenin's fault, precisely. It's been 30 years, you know, like, just because, like, you can't do anything or they don't listen to you, or they don't like you, it's not because it's communism's fault. It's like this ridiculous thing where they mention the Soviet mentality, you know, communist mentality, the you know they're so stuck in their ways no matter what's happening you know in georgia that somehow this entrenched communism is the reason that no one's able to be perfect liberal democracy <laughs> like which of course is if you know anything about what happened here has nothing to do with that. it's actually liberal democracy that's been pushed away has been pushed in such a fast way you know is the is libertarian policies are the reason why people are incredibly poor and cling on to the soviet union because it's been so horrible for 30 years um but it's really interesting because it's constantly being deployed you know it doesn't stop here as well like at a national level but i have noticed and not so much maybe georgia we're sort of the only ones so far this this is reimagining soviet georgia but you know i've been seeing conferences recently and things like that about reimagining eastern uh eastern europe or soviet or sorry socialist europe um 
um, and like Soviet Union. And it's been interesting because I feel like it's just the last like year or two that's been a, a different kind of, and it's really 30 years later that people are questioning the official narratives now, which I think is very late, but still, but still happy to see it. You know, I don't know if you've seen it or what you think about that, or if, if this around, I'm, I, I don't know about French, you know, academia, but what it's like there. Yeah, just, just to add to what, uh, so I just want to add one thing to what Sopo was saying is that, um, that, yeah, there's, uh, been this at least i can say in the u.s a lot more people who are writing about the everyday life of late socialism for example you know writing books about um you know what sopo already mentioned just things about well maybe not everything was bad that happened in the soviet union or in socialist bulgaria or in the you know there's even an organization that's in berlin dedicated to just studying the you know dynamics the social policies of the gdr and that these are now and, and, you know, one thing that's been a recurring theme on our podcast here is that um, there's been this huge divergence between, say, somebody who thinks of themselves as a, you know, nationally minded scholar, somebody who's there to reproduce the national idea, and what the has become now the common position of, say, the Soviet Union in Western academia, right? Some of these Cold War era uh, narratives of totalitarianism are becoming less and less prominent and a more nuanced view is becoming is i wouldn't say it's the dominant one yet but it's it's growing and but then you have these sort of people or uh, who are still trying to say you know no 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 that's not correct we need to have a you know total um, anti-communist framework through which we work so um yeah i think I think the the um, there is more and more um, actually uh, hi historical uh, work on the communist period, which is uh, complex and nuanced and and uh, a bit like what happened with the history of Nazism, actually with this like oral history uh, and um, uh, an attempt to go beyond just studying the regime as the regime was portraying itself, but to see what real. Uh, uh, political and social uh, practices were and how how people navigated uh, in these regimes um, and um, I mean talking for for the uh, from the French point of view it's something that has um, a, a discussion that has started um, uh, in the 1990s the late 1990s after the publication of the black book of communism which uh, was extremely badly received in France, uh, criticized uh, throughout academia, uh, even by some of the authors of the book, uh, who uh, said that they regretted they had taken part in, in this book and, and, and distanced distance themselves from, from uh, Stéphane Courtois. So I think in France, actually, the discussion about how to portray communism accurately uh, is uh, has been happening for 20 years, but of course we, are I mean, communism has a has a history in France, but it's not at all uh, the same type of uh, of um, significance, obviously. Um, but I think also in Central Europe, with the new generation of historians and um, who are uh, trained uh, to be more researchers and less militants, um, then, then there is uh, also. A renewal in in the knowledge that has been produced about about communism and it's it's a good thing because um i think you need time also again if you look at the the historiography of nazism and also the public debates about um nazism or pétain the pétain regime in france you there is a uh some time that is needed and some new generation that needs to be able to uh, ask uh, difficult questions that uh, uh, people didn't want to to raise or to tackle before. So hopefully the 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 trend is uh, going in that direction also with respect to communism. Um, 